Hello, this is Epimetheus, and this is an extended version of the video I made about Minoan history. I've added in tons of interesting information not included in the original version of this video. The last extended version of a video I made did quite well, so I wanted to say thank you by making another extra long version I hope you will enjoy. On the ancient Mediterranean island of Crete, there lived a people, fantastic, fascinating, fabulous, frivolous, fearsome, decadent, and determined. They were the Minoans. So, the term Minoan is a modern one, coined by the British archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans in the late 19th century. Evans was a gifted amateur archaeologist. Well, amateur by today's standards. Pretty much any archaeologist in the 19th century would probably be considered amateur today. Evans was definitely more professional than archaeologists like Heinrich Schliemann, who used dynamite while excavating ancient cities. Evans purchased the site of the ancient palace of Knossos. He excavated there at the sprawling palace, which had over a thousand rooms, and he identified it as the maze of the mythical king Minos, where he kept the monstrous minotaur, a fearsome half-bull, half-man. According to legend, the tyrannical Minos demanded that the Athenians send seven young men and seven maidens every seven years as a sacrifice to the Minotaur. Eventually, the Minotaur was killed by the Athenian hero Theseus, and Minoan power over Athens was broken. This myth seems to be a vague memory of when Crete had power over the mainland in the Aegean. Consequently, Sir Arthur Evans thought it would be appropriate to call this civilization Minoan after the legendary Minos. The Minoans had a very ostentatious, unique, and detailed sense of fashion, which made them a lot of fun to draw. I based all of these drawings off a combination of their surviving artwork. From their surviving painting, they really favored the colors orange, blue, and yellow. So I really tried to make those colors prominent on the color palette for all of these guys. And gals. Even though I did mix and match different patterns together, these patterns are all from surviving Minoan art. They were the first true masters of the sea in human history. Well, I suppose it would be more accurate to say they were the first true masters of the sea in human history that we know of. And it depends on how you define the words master and sea. Some could define this as the ability to navigate the Atlantic Ocean, or the first people to regularly sail fishing boats along the coastline. There also was a couple of comments in the initial video saying that the first example of the true masters of the sea would be the Austronesian migration, which was a many centuries long process, carried out by numerous Austronesian people groups. They were not a united centralized civilization, but they spoke similar dialects and shared some similar cultural customs. But as you would imagine, as time went on, the cultures and languages in the region became very different. Large-scale migration into what is now the Philippines and Southeast Asia didn't begin until after 2500 BC. The Minoans had regular contact with the Cyclades Islands to their north around a thousand years before this. But if you define master of the sea as regularly sailing on the open ocean, then, based on the current evidence, it does appear that the Austronesians were the first true masters of the sea. Or if you define it like me, where it's the first civilization to get in the boats, raid, trade, and collect tribute, as well as having their whole society centered around maritime activities, then it would be the Minoans. And they exploited their superior abilities to control those around them. They have often been called the first European civilization. Here's another fun one for lovers of semantical salad. How do you define first, how do you define European, and how do you define a civilization? Some consider some of the Neolithic cultures on mainland Europe as the first European civilization. Or others don't consider the Minoans European enough for the cut of their jib. Whatever the case may be, Minoan civilization is far more impressive than any culture that came before it in what is now considered to be Europe. And their writing, architecture, and art is far more advanced than anything else found there to date. So even though I did the disclaimer of they've often been called the first European civilization, would I call them the first European civilization? Yeah. Their unique and elaborate society ended in a cycle of catastrophe, foreign domination, and destruction. The island of Crete is located in the eastern Mediterranean, at the nexus of ancient maritime trade routes linking Europe, Western Asia, and North Africa together. From the Bronze Age to medieval times, these trade routes didn't change that much. The eastern Mediterranean is pretty stormy, so most pre-modern sailors like to stay reasonably close to a shoreline. Travel and trade directly between Crete and Egypt did occur in later times. And given that there is evidence that the Minoans traded a lot with the ancient Egyptians, it is likely that they directly sailed there as well. 
the strategic position of the island, and its ample natural resources set up Crete for a remarkable history. Minoan history can be divided into four periods. The pre-palatial period, the proto-palatial period, the neo-palatial period, and the post-palatial period. So this is one of many dating chronologies for Minoan history. Some have different names for the periods and wildly different dates. Several of these dates are tied to natural disasters where there was destruction on Crete, and the dates for those disasters are always being tweaked by academics. Some chronologies break Minoan history down into as many as like, 17 different phases. I like this one, but if I were to make my own, I would tweak it a little bit. I would have the protopalatial period start 100 or 200 years earlier, and I'd have the postpalatial period begin at 1450 BC, because that's when the Mycenaeans conquered Crete. So I filmed all of these ocean scenes on my phone, at a beach my family used to go to when I was a kid. Once I got the idea stuck in my head of filming the tide pools and transposing the dates over them, I pretty much had to go. I felt like I spent most of my day stuck in traffic going to and from the coast, but it was still worth it. During the pre-palatial period, the Minoan civilization slowly emerged, mastering farming and seafaring technologies. The proto-palatial period saw the Minoans develop international trade routes and a booming economy centered around massive palace administrative complexes. The neo-palatial period was the height of Minoan power and prosperity. This gave way to a more turbulent age where invaders from the mainland dominated Crete and the island's influence, power, and prosperity collapsed. So it took me way too long to build that little tower of rocks. It was pretty windy that day, and either the stack of rocks was too flimsy and the wind would blow it over, or it was too structurally sound and the waves couldn't knock it down. So when this one was finally knocked over by a wave, I was <laughs> pretty happy. Long before Minoan society developed in humanity's prehistoric past, many of the early inhabitants of Crete most likely arrived there by accident. So, emphasis on the most likely. Whenever this happened, it would have been long before there was a ancient Egypt or Sumerian civilization. So, it is reasonable to assume that the people who first came to Crete were using some of humanity's earliest and most primitive sailing vessels, like the dugout canoe, which is essentially just a hollowed-out log. Again, that is what's most likely, but, again, not for sure. Primitive fishing boats, rafts, and wreckage, carried out to sea by the tide or by storms, stumbled into Crete. The watercraft carried fishermen, fugitives, marooned adventurers, and migrants from around the mainland of the eastern Mediterranean. They decided to stay. The island remained sparsely populated by hunter-gatherers and coastal fishermen. Also, I think it's important to emphasize that during this time of hunters and gatherers and fishermen being there for thousands of years, there's a constant trickle of people from around the eastern Mediterranean coming to the island and amalgamating with the local population. And this very long and complex process produced a unique people. In the original shorter version of this video, there were many comments saying something along the lines of the Minoans were from place XYZ. For example, the Minoans were from Egypt, the Minoans were from what's now Turkey, or the Levant, or Libya, or mainland Greece. All of these are wrong, but they're also all kind of right. And some percentage of people from those places ended up in Crete. Some of them a large percent, some a small percent. It's so far back that it's incredibly difficult to say with any certainty this was the majority group at this time and whatever. This is one of those subjects where there is some scholarly debate surrounding it. I believe the latest DNA studies have shown that the most prominent proportion of the DNA from the founding groups were from the Levant and Anatolia, with the majority being from Anatolia, which pretty much jives with what one would get from looking at the material record. I'm usually super hesitant to mention DNA in any of my videos for several reasons. One, the study of ancient DNA is still in its infancy. The results for the commercial find out your ancestry type DNA tests are always jumping about depending on how many samples they're comparing it to. And these results get more accurate over time the more samples they have to compare any one sample to. And with ancient DNA, um, often they're comparing very few samples to also very few samples. So some preliminary results can drastically change. 
when new ancient samples become available to compare. It is a very interesting science that undoubtedly will become far more accurate in the years to come. And it's a valuable tool to give you a general ballpark idea. The second reason I've shied away from discussing DNA in my videos previously is that it's somewhat complex. I've read enough about ancient DNA to know that I'm far from being an expert on the subject. The internet is currently full of legions of people misinterpreting ancient DNA data, and I don't feel like joining that type of legion. Probably three out of four times I see the word haplogroup in a comment on a history video. There's some blatant exaggeration or misinterpretation going on in the rest of the comment. And you will often see different people using the exact same DNA study to make opposite points. Anyways, that's enough of a rambling diatribe about DNA. Now back to Minoan history. Until around 7000 BC, when farming was introduced, possibly by migrant Anatolian farmers, the population steadily increased. Again, to quickly reiterate here, here in the pre-palatial age when Greek transitions from the Neolithic period to the Copper and Bronze Ages, culture and people are being exchanged with the people around the Aegean, particularly the Cycladic Islands. And these people are merging with the Neolithic inhabitants of Crete. And again, to what proportion this is occurring is a matter of debate. And by the mid to later 4th millennium BC, several other important technologies were adopted, like the potter's wheel and metalworking, which drastically increased productivity and efficiency. So Neolithic people spent an incredible amount of time making pottery and stone tools, both of which tend to break. The potter's wheel meant you could mass-produce pottery, which freed up a lot of the labor force to specialize in other areas. And once copper working was introduced in the mid-4th millennium BC, that also freed up a lot of labor, because metal tools could be repaired, unlike stone tools, which, if broken, could be made into a smaller tool, but you lost a lot of material and time. Domesticated cattle, sheep, goats, and pigs were also introduced. Cattle were especially valued, as they were used to plow fields. They also provided nutritious sources of protein, like meat, milk, and cheese. Other animal byproducts like textiles and leather fueled early Minoan industry and trade. Throughout Minoan history, textiles, which is pretty much just a fancy word for any type of cloth or fabric, was a mainstay of Minoan trade. Over time, the Minoans specialized in more items for trade that were processed or manufactured, as opposed to raw materials. Like textiles, where sewing in an elaborate pattern to a fabric can increase the price. The Minoans imported gold and ivory and turned it into jewelry and exported it. Local clay was turned into desirable high-quality pottery, and olives were pressed into oil, which was another high-profit mainstay of Minoan trade. Initially, the proto-Minoans leveled up their seafaring experience by sailing along the coast of their own island. So this was pretty unclear the way I wrote this and had the caption up there saying pre-palatial. When I said the proto-Minoans, I meant to convey the Minoans before the pre-palatial period were the ones sailing around the island and leveling up their skill. By even the early pre-palatial period, they were already in pretty regular contact, it seems, with all the Cyclades islands to their north. But the process of leveling up their abilities and seafaring technology um, began before the pre-palatial, but definitely continued throughout the pre-palatial of getting better ships and whatnot. As it was easier to trade goods with other coastal settlements by boat than to trek through the mountainous terrain of the 150 mile long island, and that probably stayed true till pretty modern times, that before roads and automobiles and all that, that um, sailing was probably the easiest way to get around the island even in medieval or early modern times. Throughout Minoan history, the vast majority of the island's population was concentrated on the eastern half of the island as it had the best farmland. And of the best farmland, the most fertile region was and still is the Masara Plain. Today and in ancient times, the region was a hub for olive and grape growing. And the clay found in this plain was the source for much of the Minoan's high-quality pottery. Crete was self-sufficient. It had plenty of food sources, fresh water, and timber to build boats. All basic necessities needed for a great seafaring civilization. But there was something missing on their island metal, specifically copper and tin, needed to make bronze. Metals were the crude oil of the ancient world, needed to fuel a civilization's construction, military, and agricultural productivity. After mastering the basics of seafaring and making improvements to their boats, Minoan merchants began trading with the Cycladic Islands to their north. 
and then began exploring and trading with the other peoples of the Aegean. The Minoans on Crete and the inhabitants of the Cyclades Islands formed close cultural and economic ties that were to last for more than a thousand years. Uh, close to 2,000 years. Around the beginning of the second millennium BC, the economy on Crete was booming. Larger and larger homes were being built for an emerging ruling class of merchants, priests, and nobles. So really, the first palace period could begin anywhere around these dates, and it, I guess it really depends on what size of a big house would you consider a palace. These homes, along with warehouses and workshops, began to merge into larger palace complexes. This was the first palace period on Crete, during which the Minoans began to flex their muscle, occupying the Cyclades Islands. So I got a couple of comments asking if the Minoans used the figure 8 shield here, and the answer is yes they did. The figure 8 shield is a very iconic design associated with the later Mycenaeans, but in fact the earliest depictions of it are from the Minoans. And I think all of the early depictions of it are from around 1600 BC. I am sure this type of shield was invented before its earliest depiction, but this guy may be holding this shield a little too early for his time period. And establishing ever further trade routes, the Minoans began regular trade with the island of Cyprus, where they acquired large amounts of copper. They also established regular trade with the Amorite kingdoms and Canaanite city-states of the Levant. One of the most interesting items of Minoan export was their very unique style of fresco painting which used two layers of lime plaster over a polished surface in combination with stucco. Examples of Minoan-style fresco have been found in the kingdom of Yamhad and in a palace in Egypt. In the Egyptian example, from the colors used to the bull-leaping iconography, everything seems very Minoan. So much so that some scholars believe these must have been made by native Minoan artists. It may even be evidence of a possible dynastic marriage as a Minoan would take comfort from their native style of art displayed in the palace. Other scholars disagree with this and think that the artists may not have even been Minoan. An alternative hypothesis is that the frescoes are evidence of the interconnected world of the time. One possible scenario is that painters from the Levant and Egypt worked on Crete and returned to their home countries with new skills. These may have been apprentices of some of the Minoan master painters as some sort of cultural exchange between the royal courts. Or the Minoans contracted these foreign painters because they needed a really massive labor force of painters to paint their massive palaces. One scenario I think is very likely is that foreign merchants and diplomats visited the palace at Knossos and other palaces on Crete. They saw the frescoes adorning the palaces and were extremely impressed. Seeking to curry favor with their king back home, they hired a couple Minoan painters, probably paying them or their masters an exorbitant fee, brought them back and put them in charge of a full team of painters, and taught them the Minoan style of fresco. Whichever scenario is the actual real scenario that happened, it is really fascinating to look at such an interesting cultural exchange in the second millennium BC. The kingdom of Egypt became the Minoan's most lucrative trading partner. There they acquired vast amounts of gold, which could be traded at much higher prices elsewhere in the Mediterranean. The Minoans also became skilled metalworkers and could trade finished gold items at an even higher price for a greater profit margin. The vast amount of resources the Minoans accumulated necessitated that they develop a written script to help keep track of it all, who owned what, record contracts, and possibly record important events. First, the Minoans developed a unique hieroglyphic script possibly inspired by their contact with the ancient Egyptians. This was gradually replaced by a more functional-looking script, creatively called by historians, Linear A. Unfortunately, neither of these scripts have ever been deciphered. Well, at least for now. So in the comments of the shorter version of this video, there were several people saying that um, it's already been deciphered. This is pretty much not true. There are several scholars and researchers that believe that they have deciphered some words in Linear A, but even that is a topic of hot debate at, the point, at this point in time. Maybe when you watch this video in the future, that won't be the case. But currently, from everything I've read, it's not the case that anybody in the world could pretty much pick up a linear A tablet and read it. At best, it's a handful of words or maybe a phrase or two that someone has deciphered. Some of the scholars and researchers who believe that they have deciphered some of the language um, also believe that it's related to a Lev Levantine language or others believe that it's very closely related to the Mycenaean Greek, Linear B. I also saw some people posting an article which claimed Linear A had been deciphered. 
I don't know if they were doing it as a joke or that they didn't notice that the article was published on April 1st. And the source at the bottom of the article was something like uh, the Center for Greek and Hellenic Linguistic Studies or something. But the link is to the link on the Wikipedia article on April 1st Day Pranks. So if people were posting that as a joke, very funny. And if you thought it was uh, real, then I don't know, read a little closer next time. But anyways, it will be glorious when we finally can read Linear A. I am almost 100% sure that there's probably a Rosetta Stone type object for Minoan and Egyptian languages, given the large amount of contact and trade between the two civilizations. But let's just hope they weren't all destroyed and there's one buried under the ground somewhere on Crete or in Egypt, or maybe somewhere else in the Near East. Maybe one day, one of you will decipher it, and we can learn much more details about Minoan economy, history, politics, and religion. In the late 18th century BC, a massive series of earthquakes appears to have rocked the island, destroying at least four of the island's most important palace complexes, and much of the surrounding cities and towns. This destruction and death might have been enough to cause the downfall of a less robust civilization. I think this is primarily due to the Minoan naval superiority and pretty much dominance of the whole Aegean Sea at this time. And they probably tried to keep the whole event a secret from their enemies and trading partners. With the ocean and their navy protecting them, they were in a much better position than, let's say, a Mesopotamian civilization where something similar could have happened. In Mesopotamia and Anatolia, there was always all these uh, mountain tribes and petty kingdoms on the periphery of the larger empires, ready to take advantage of a bad situation. But in fact, it seems to have had the opposite effect, and strengthened the Minoan's resolve. All the palace complexes and destroyed buildings were quickly rebuilt on a colossal scale. The largest palace at Knossos covered six acres and had more than 1,000 rooms, approximately 1,300. Some areas of the luxurious palace were up to five stories tall, and the complex boasted a theater. So the theater at Knossos held about 400 people. In contrast to Greek and Roman theaters, the religious ceremonies, athletic games, and dances that took place there were only meant for the highest nobility to watch. There was also a large central courtyard, which is probably where the famous bull-leaping ceremonies took place. Many large warehouses and workshops. So the warehouses would have held the reserve supply of olive oil, and grains and dried foods like fish, meats, beans, and olives. The palace is also where much of the olive oil and wine would have been made, as well as the more expensive fabrics and jewelry. It also had an advanced system of indoor plumbing. So the palace had three separate water management systems. One of them was for the palace's water supply. One of them was for drainage runoff during the rainy season. And the third was for wastewater. The water was brought from about 6 miles or 10 kilometers away. And the water system was made out of terracotta pipes, which were tapered on one end to make it pressure-fitting with the next piece. There were toilets in the palace, which were flushed by pouring a jug of water into the toilet after you used the latrine, which took the waste into the palace's sewer system. The main aqueduct also branched off and supplied water to the nearby town or city. The town around Knossos grew into a massive city with a population that may have been as high as 100,000 people. Based on the archaeological record, it is the generally accepted scholarly consensus that throughout the Neopalatial period, Knossos was the dominant, if not absolute, power center on Crete, with other palace centers, towns, and rural villas all owing allegiance to Knossos. It is a subject of scholarly debate if Knossos dominated the other palace centers before the Neopalatial period, In fact, there is very little known about the Minoan form of government from any time period, and how the relations were between the different palace complexes. One piece of evidence that indicates that the Minoans were internally united is that there is currently no evidence for war between the different Minoan centers. One theory I think is possible that falls in line with the Minoans being pragmatic merchant negotiators is that at some early point in their history, they figured out that war was not good for business. If any significant amount of men were left behind to defend the home front, those were men who could not be used as fishermen, sailors, and merchants, and even soldiers in somebody else's land instead of their own. Also, perhaps it is possible that the later Mycenaean Greek practice of having two warriors duel before a battle to spare the lives of the soldiers involved came from the Minoans, which would make sense for 
that they generally seem peaceful, and if only you had pairs of soldiers fighting, they wouldn't be destroying cities and workshops and destroying the economy along with it. So, as a disclaimer, I did not read the theory of the Minoans dueling to prevent warfare on their island anywhere. That is just something I also thought would be a possibility that could fit the historical record. Or maybe even the bull leaping ceremony was some way to uh, discourage conflict or to settle conflict. If you have a different theory on why the different Minoan palace complexes didn't really seem to have engaged in a war with each other, let me know down in the comments. There was the old theory that was more popular like 50 plus years ago that the Minoans were a completely hippie, feminine, just lovey-dovey society that didn't like war, but that's been pretty much proven false. Because they have uncovered weapons and depictions of warfare. From the surviving art at their palaces, it is clear that they preferred scenes of peace to scenes of war while at home. But that does not prove that they weren't warlike, and may only indicate that their island they viewed as a place of peace and rest, in the midst of a Mediterranean world where warfare was frequent and catastrophic for those involved. From much later classical Greek legend, folklore, and histories, it is asserted that a king named Minos ruled from Knossos. He established an empire in the Aegean, founded colonies, and stamped out piracy. In regard to the Minoans, the Greek historian Herodotus used the term Thelesocracy to describe this type of seafaring empire. In recent times, it has been hypothesized that Minos was a Minoan word for king, or perhaps a title like Caesar, where later kings took the name of an early great king. Another example is the Parthians, who used Arsaces, the name of their first great king, as a title. And it can make things very confusing when a later king would sign his inscription or coin only with the name Arsaces. So it could be a similar situation where the Minoan king had the title of Minos, and later Greeks confused that t commonly used title as the name of a particular king. Other scholars have hypothesized that the Minoans did not even have a king. As in many of my other videos, when I notice there's a divide between scholarly opinion, I try to present the major views on the subject and leave it up to the viewer to decide what makes more sense. But instead, we're ruled over by priestess queens. At Kenosis, there is a throne room. However, in the significant amount of Minoan art found throughout Crete, there is no clear example of a kingly figure depicted. In contrast, there are numerous examples of prominent females depicted that have been interpreted as goddesses, priestesses, or perhaps even queens. So these two Minoan ladies I drew were partially based off of, inspired by these little statuettes. This one got the double snakes, this one got the double axes, and this one has the triple-decker snake crown, which I think looks very reminiscent of Mesopotamian-style crowns. Whatever the case may be, from surviving art it appears women did play a dominant role in religion and palace life, in contrast to other Near Eastern cultures, where men are depicted far more often than women. In Minoan art it is the opposite, women are more common, and dress far more elaborately than the fellas. Men are usually shown performing outdoor manual labor, or as soldier sailors. This probably led to the artistic convention of portraying men as heavily tanned, and most women as pale white, as it was probably a status symbol to have noble women spending away their hours indoors. Here's another striking example I found in a book of men and women portrayed with uh, very different complexions. The vitamin D deficient look became so desirable that applying toxic white lead makeup became a thing. This same artistic convention is also seen in early Roman fresco. But palatial life was not all toxic beauty and ostentatious dresses. While the men were away, the women played politics and managed the economy. This evolves naturally in societies where males are indisposed for long periods of time. Like in the much later Spartan society, where the warrior elite lived in all-male communes training for war and broing it out, while their wives engaged in business and managed the economy. On Crete, many merchant and warrior sailors were gone from the island at any given time, and many also drowned at sea, so the island would have had a disproportionate amount of women. The returning merchant sailors evidently adorned their wives with every manner of luxury and every lavish fabric from far-off lands. Some early scholars assumed the Minoans were a peaceful, unwarlike people because their cities had no walls, and the near absence of warfare in their art, the relatively small number of their weapons that had been unearthed. On the first point, their cities, towns, and palaces did not need walls. They had wooden walls. Their navy patrolled the Aegean, and they were confident in their superior nautical abilities and intimate knowledge of the waters surrounding Crete. 
Their merchants and spies likely knew of any major potential threat before their enemies had even finished building their fleet. The Minoans rarely portrayed military in their art, probably because they rarely engaged in conflict. Again, that is speculation. At minimum, they didn't engage in conflict very often, but it is also quite possible that they quite often engaged in conflict. My guess is Minoan-style conflict may have been somewhat similar to um, conflict fought by the other nautical empires, like the British, Portuguese, Dutch, and Spanish, where they would hit their enemies hard and without warning and use, try to use that strategically place violence to negotiate better trade deals or tribute or something along those lines. It may be like the Dutch Empire. Profit instead of territorial expansion was the main goal of the Minoans. The threat of bringing overwhelming force to any point in the Aegean was probably enough to cause a troublesome city to offer tribute, realizing that any resistance would be futile. The Mycenaeans of mainland Greece emerged in the 18th century BC as a vassal or tributary of the Minoans. Like the Minoans, the Mycenaeans are another one where we don't really know what they called themselves. Their name is a derivation from Mycenae, or Mycenae in Greek, or also pronounced Mycenae. In the much later Greek epic, the Iliad, these people are called Argives, Danins, or Achaeans. The only contemporary references that are widely believed to refer to them are from the Hittites, and they called the Mycenaeans Ahiawa, or Ahia, which may be linguistically related to the Homeric Achaeans. For over a century, the Minoans were at the height of their power. No nearby kingdom or people posed any real threat. None of the contemporary empires of the Minoans had a formidable navy, especially when compared to the Minoans, so they probably felt pretty safe. Then, the important Minoan trading center and colony of Thera exploded. It was one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions in human history. The force of the eruption triggered massive tsunamis that devastated the northern coastline of Crete. It is probable that the immense tidal waves sank much of the Minoan fleet. The determined Minoans had experienced devastating natural disasters before, but none like this. So to read this caption and comment on it a little bit more, the date of the eruption, 16th-ish century BC, and the extent of the damage to the palaces following the Thera eruption is a matter of intense scholarly debate. So to address the 16th-ish century BC for the date of the explosion is traditionally the date was put around 1500 BC when Thera erupted. As more and more tests have been done on the island of Santorini and the surrounding area, the date just keeps getting pushed back. From the last couple decades, tests have estimated that the eruption happened somewhere in the mid-1500s to later 1500s BC and to the early 1600s to mid-1600s, and now it's back down around 1600. I'm sure whatever is the most recent estimate is going to get revised up or down and is going to be uh, obsolete pretty soon. Amidst all this confusion, the only thing that seems certain is that the old theory that the Thera eruption was the immediate cause of the Minoan civilization's collapse is false. Instead, it does seem that the Thera eruption was the cause for the Minoan decline, however. Before it was thought the Thera eruption happened, and then a couple decades later, the Mycenaean Greeks conquered the island around 1450 BC. But now it looks like the gap is 90 or 100 years on the low end, or maybe as high as 150 or 200 years on the high end. But it also seems clear that after the Thera eruption, they can no longer dominate the Aegean how they used to. Despite the massive setbacks, they began to slowly rebuild. It was during this time that the Mycenaean states of the mainland began to build up their own fleets, which they used to take the Minoan islands one by one. It might have been a fair fight, leading to a long, drawn-out war between the two civilizations. But then, disaster struck again, earthquakes rocked Crete, many died, and the partially rebuilt ruins became ruins again. The depopulated Minoans began to rebuild again, but were undoubtedly demoralized. Even if it was 100 or 150 years before, I'm sure they were still talking about that time their island of Thera blew up. And on top of that, they got massive tidal waves and a bunch of earthquakes. People stopped paying tribute, and the mainlanders were taking over their islands. So I think their morale would have been pretty low. Their faith in their gods probably diminished, and priestesses waving around snakes or axes in the air was probably not as comforting as it once was. Sometime around 1450 BC, the mainland Mycenaeans arrived and conquered the island. 
A new Mycenaean ruling class set up shop at Knossos, where they built a new palace. Throughout the remainder of the post-palatial period, Minoan culture was gradually replaced by Mycenaean. Minoan Linear A was replaced by Mycenaean Linear B, which used the same symbols to represent different sounds. Also a matter of debate is to what extent the Mycenaeans replaced the existing population, or if they were merely just a new ruling class. The Mycenaeans would have been somewhat similar to the Minoans in culture and ancestry, which makes it somewhat difficult to tell what happened after the Mycenaean invasion, and why the post-palatial period is generally considered part of Minoan history, and it doesn't just end at 1450 or 1500. A level of prosperity did return to the island, but it was a pale shadow of its former monopolistic opulence. I think the most likely thing to have happened here is that um, the Mycenaeans who conquered Crete broke off their allegiances to the mainland and independently ruled. They were in no way as powerful as early Minoans, but probably still taxed some of the trade going back and forth between Cyprus with uh, copper. The Mycenaean states were on the periphery of the interconnected system of great empires of the later Bronze Age. In contrast to the relatively united empires of the East, the Mycenaeans were a very loose confederation of states centered around fortified palace complexes. In contrast to the Minoans, early on in Mycenaean civilization, their palace complexes were fortified. If the later Greeks' fuzzy memories through the Homeric epics and later historians are to be believed, the Mycenaean Greeks or Achaeans were just as quarrelsome as the later classical Greeks. It is likely that their squabbling and rivalries made them vulnerable when in the late 13th century BC. Nobody expects the sea people! The sea peoples were a sortie of saucy sailing scallywags and one of several contributing factors to the Bronze Age collapse, which to briefly sum up was a very dark, dark age where people were illiterate and vermin. Pirates and internal rebellion overwhelmed the Mycenaeans. As early as 1278, a piratical people known as the Sheridan had raided Egypt and terrorized the eastern Mediterranean. It is very likely these were the same marauders who were tormenting the Mycenaeans, and the numerous Aegean islands would have been the ideal piratical base for such ill-intended people. On Crete, I uh, just noticed an error here in the animation. The last time I showed Crete was correct, with the Mycenaeans only rebuilding Knossos. Here I incorrectly show all of them being rebuilt at the time around 1200 BC. The palaces and towns were destroyed. Again. In contrast to the destruction layers caused by earthquakes, this destruction was caused by fire. And the perpetrators unknown. Some of the likely candidates include the Sheridan, probably accompanied by some of their known associates at the time like the Shekelesh or the Luca. The Shekelesh were likely from Sicily, and the Luca were from southern Anatolia for sure and are well attested to both in Hittite and Egyptian records. Another popular theory is that throughout Mycenaean Greece, the common people rose up and overthrew the ruling class. This is based off the fact that some of the Mycenaean citadels and palaces were destroyed, while the towns and cities surrounding them were unharmed. Like at Tiryns. To my knowledge, there's no evidence for something like this happening at the palace at Knossos. However, I believe the common people on Crete would have had just as much or more motivation than their counterparts on the mainland to rebel against the Mycenaean nobility, who had turned the trajectory of the island's prosperity upside down. Some survivors built remote fortified hilltop settlements, which are evidence of the turbulent times. It also appears that many throughout the Aegean and coastal Anatolia joined the marauders. Some of these, like the Luca, were begrudging Hittite vassals, and in the ultimate wave of sea people, the majority appear to be of Aegean origin, based on their arms and style of dress. They moved east along the coast, leaving a swath of destruction in their wake. Their rampage culminated with a failed invasion of Egypt. There were two major assaults on the Nile Delta that took place 30 years apart. These motley bands of miscellaneous malcontented Mediterranean marauders, with mayhem on their minds, were composed of different people groups from around the central and eastern Mediterranean. In the first wave, the Shardana, also known as the Sheridan, appeared to be the most numerous. In the final assault, the Peliset appear to have been the most numerous, because they are the most often depicted, as well as they are the most often mentioned in Egyptian accounts. Some of the captured people of the sea, called the Peliset, were resettled in southern Canaan. Their descendants became known as the Philistines. Scholars generally agree that the Peliset were of Aegean origin, 
The clothing, arms, and armor of the Pelisset are extremely close to those worn by the Mycenaeans. The style of the homes they built are similar to Aegean homes, and they also brought a Aegean breed of pig to the region. And the most popular theory is that they were descended from the amalgamated Minoans and Mycenaeans of Crete. So the family tree of the Philistines would look something like this. The Mycenaeans and the Minoans created the Peleset, and the Peleset and the Canaanites admixture created the Philistines. Which, if you would like to know more about the Philistines, check out the video I made about them. As the whole greater Near East fell into a dark age, Crete became a sparsely populated backwater, and memory of its once glorious past faded into myth and legend, and much of it was forgotten. 3,000 years after Minoan civilization collapsed, they were rediscovered. The first archaeologist to undertake excavations at Knossos was named Minos. How cool is that? Very cool. I didn't notice this when I was filming this at the beach, but uh, I think this is a seal or perhaps a piece of seaweed floating in the ocean. While making the original shorter version of this video, I got pretty ill, and it took me longer than I would like to recover. Which is the main reason the last video took so long to come out, despite not putting out any new videos for over three months. Interest in my old videos still remained high, which allowed me to pay all my bills and not worry too much. I am profoundly grateful for all of your interest in history, which keeps allowing me to be able to do this. My channel has just recently reached 500,000 subscribers, which I never imagined anything like this happening when I was first uploading videos for fun. I have worked outdoors in retail stores and in cubicles, but nothing I've done before beats studying history, drawing, and sharing it with you guys. And now, for something completely different. Something I did not expect to stumble upon in the big city. Hello, there's a Prometheus in my backyard, and there's this little owl right here. And I got him a piece of meat, but he seems more interested in the blue jays and hummingbirds that are buzzing about right now that are quite perturbed about his presence. Lastly, I'd like to thank my tremendous patrons over on Patreon, who have supported me through thick and thin. Thank you so much, guys and gals. I'm super excited and looking forward to 2022, where I want to thank you all by producing better content than ever before.